Welcome to the Coaster 101 podcast. I am Eric Woolley, our West Coast correspondent out here in San Francisco. Joining me today are John Stevenson down in Nashville. Hi, John. How are you? Hey, Eric. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Uh, And Nick Weisenberger in Ohio. How's it going? You may notice that Andrew is not with us tonight. He is currently traveling. But it doesn't matter that Andrew isn't here because the three of us recently went to Canada's Wonderland. John and I, for the first time ever, and Nick, it was sort of your first full day at Canada's Wonderland, right? That's correct. Uh, Yeah, so we're going to get into a park that is basically new for all three of us. Uh, And Andrew didn't join us, so he isn't here to talk about it. I think we can sort of dive right into it. Uh, For anyone who hasn't been to Canada's Wonderland is a... Cedar Fair Park, just outside of Toronto. It is, it's got to have one of the largest roller coaster collections in North America. I'm guessing John and Nick probably knows this. 17 coasters now, and uh, there'll be 18 next year with the addition of the uh, new kitty coaster that was announced, Snoopy's Racing Railway. Yeah. Like I said, none of us had been there, so we decided that we wanted to take a trip and ride all of the coasters that they have, and especially. Um, the big three, which I think is where we want to start. So anyone who's familiar with Canada's Wonderland there are, would know that there's basically three very large, very highly regarded B&M coasters, um, a B&M Hyper, a B&M Giga Coaster, and a B&M Dive Coaster. Uh, and I think the three of us would agree that those were the best three coasters at the park without question, right? Yeah, hands down. So I think maybe, well, I don't know if we actually, I found it very hard to like compare those and rank them against each other. So I figured we would just go through each one and kind of give our thoughts on them. Maybe starting with what I think is the oldest of them, which is Behemoth, the the B&M Hyper Coaster uh, at Canada's Wonderland. Uh, Nick, what are, tell us something about Behemoth and and what your, what your thoughts were on it. Had you any expectations for it going in? You'd been on it before, right? This is one of the few that I had been on before, been to the park uh, two other times with real uh, short experiences. So I just rode uh, some of the the top coasters there. But um, yeah, Behemoth is open in 2008. It's B&M Hyper Coaster, 230 feet tall, 5,318 feet long. And this is one of the ones that has the offset seating, like the split style seating that's Mm -hmm. kind of in a V formation. And it's actually, there's only four of those in the world. Uh, like Diamondback at Kings Island being one of the other ones. And this thing is just full of airtime. I mean, it's like the the beginning of the ride, a huge drop, hits 77 miles per hour. Then you go into a, a big airtime hill, hammerhead turnaround, and then there's just three massive airtime hills. So it's the beginning of the ride, it's just like nothing but airtime. It's really good. Definitely one of the, the better B&M hyper coasters. John, did you have a, how does it, how does it rank? among B&M hypers that that you've been on. I would say um maybe not the maybe not my favorite but definitely I would say top 5. I mean I'm thinking you know comparing it ob- obviously to Diamondback at, at Kings Island. There's some similarities there. Uh, of course no splashdown unfortunately, but uh, may not be the most intense. Uh, I did really like the uh hammerhead turnaround. I thought that was a uh really nice element added some a variety to the, you know, obviously the uh, airtime hill after airtime hill. So it was uh, overall, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think I'm sort of in a similar camp. It's always hard for me to rank coasters, especially when there are lots that I haven't been on in a long time. But I think I was, uh, I think I was surprised by how good it was. Not that like all B and M hypers are pretty good, but I think like after riding it, something sort of what you said, Nick. It felt to me like maybe it had more airtime than something like Nitro or Apollo's Chariot, which are maybe the ones I've been on most recently. Um, it f- feels very fast through the whole track. Well, I think with the longer train as well, that really makes, and I, I'm fairly certain we rode towards the back in at least one, at least one of the times yep. we rode it. And uh, I think because of that longer train, that really makes the back couple of cars give a, a pretty intense ride. Yeah, and I think it's also, I mean, it, it like many of these, it's got a nice location along mm-hmm. the edge of the park, along a uh, body of water. Um, yeah, I think it's maybe not my maybe not my number one B&M Hyper, but it's definitely 
top ride. And I don't know, maybe we'll get into this after we talk about all three of them, but it may have actually been my favorite ride at the park. Certainly uh, not, it's not like way behind the other two big B&Ms. Um, which maybe we can get into the the second one of those. So Leviathan, which opened in 2012, is B and M uh, Giga Coaster. I think technically at 306 feet. Nick, I know that yeah. you and maybe actually John, have you also been on all three of the Giga Coasters now, or the B and M Gigas? Yeah, actually, yes, I have. Yep, um, Fury at Carowinds and Orion at Kings Island, and now Leviathan. So yeah, all three of them. And Nick, you have as well, right? Yep. I have not been on Orion yet. Do you, how do you, what do you think of maybe start with what do you think of Leviathan and then like how do you think it compares to the other two? Maybe John, start with you and what what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, like the other two B&M gigas I've ridden, I mean, Leviathan was amazing. Um, I think its biggest flaw is that it's too short, of course. I feel like that's been said many times before, but um, for the first, you know, it was the first B&M giga, so it was so huge for you know literally and figuratively for the company i think and so um just knowing that you know makes it a, a really special ride and uh even though it may be short it's still over five thousand. you know short i say in quotations it's still over five thousand feet in length so it's it's a good ride it's uh like fury it interacts uh at least a portion of it with the entrance to the park which i really like like it's mm-hmm. really easy to see that's Kind of one of my not issues, but one thing that I miss about Orion is that you know it kind of takes place away from the midway, so it's it's not as easy to to watch. So, but the pacing is incredible. The drop is amazing. I mean, it's you know you kind of know what you're getting, but it was uh, it was definitely my favorite of the of the B and M's at Car- at uh, Canada's Wonderland. Nick, how has has it compared to uh, Orion and Fury for you? So we rode Leviathan two times on our on our visit there because it had, I think, the longest line. Around an hour wait, 45 to an hour. is isn't too bad. So the, the first time we rode it, I think we rode like in the middle-ish of the train mm-hmm. early afternoon. And my initial impression coming back in the station was, oh, Orion's much better. But then we rode it. Um, it was the last ride uh, that we went on. We rode it in the front row right at 10 o'clock when the park was closing and that ride was incredible like that was a really uh, special ride to me because we had an amazing day at the park rode a ton of rides and so that was just the perfect way to cap off our day was a front row ride on leviathan and, and it just felt so much faster at nighttime the air time was better so that that last ride really blew me away so if, if you kind of take the average of our rides it's i don't know for me it's it's, it's really hard to separate it from orion they're pretty similar but yeah, that like it's the one ride was was better, but the other ride was worse. So I guess it, it depends <laughs> when you ride it, where you yeah. ride, it, what the conditions that you ride it are in. Yeah, I think my thought was sort of the first time we rode it, I was maybe a little underwhelmed. Although I think that was mostly because of expectations for it. I've been on Fury, haven't been on Orion, but like it's huge. It's supposed to be probably generally regarded as the best ride at Canada's Wonderland. So I think my expectations for it were very, were very high and it was good. It was fun, but it wasn't like, I, like I said, I think certainly after the first ride, I would have said I liked behemoth more. Um, but then, yeah, that ending, ending the day with front row at night on it felt, I mean, front row on any of these giant rides is pretty amazing yeah, with they're the, all good front row rides the, the yeah. wind uh keeping your <laughs> pushing your face back kind of thing um and yeah it was that was a, certainly an excellent way to cap the day and i think re re-elevated it towards like yeah. oh yeah this is one of probably one of the best coasters i've ever been on i, I still do wish though that it had a more climatic ending it's just yeah. like it ends with an overbank turn that doesn't really do much for you and then you go into the world's tallest break run <laughs> yeah, and it, it certainly feels like it has a lot of energy left when yes. you go into that break run. We're like, oh, it's it like, could. Uh, you you could have done a lot more here. <laughs> could have. Had I think that's more. the. I think that's the case for a lot of prototypes. I mean, technically, this I think this was a prototype for B and M. So it's it seems like even though there was nothing necessarily groundbreaking about this compared to uh, their hyper coasters, I think sometimes they do tend to cut those first of their kind prototype coasters a little bit short 
That's a good point because I think if you look at like the lift hill, the way the lift hill is constructed is a lot different from the hyper coasters because like the chain return is in its own like separate channel. The, the chain returns inside of the spine and like the spine of the track is actually used as part of the support structure and like an arch shape going all the way to the ground yeah. instead of just being held up with the columns. So that's a, a, a good point. It's also technically it is slightly longer than Orion. Yeah. At least according to RCDB, it's like 150 really? feet longer. But as we all know, Orion, only 200 something feet tall. So like that could just be the difference. <laughs> yeah, it's I like... just barely got in there for the giga status. It's <laughs> that, like standing on its tiptoes. That trench or whatever it's got yeah. to, to give it the 100 foot drop. But I think we can all safely say that, yes, Leviathan is a very good coaster and maybe like on its own worth a trip to... Canada's Wonderland, and certainly with the other two, which then sort of the last of the the big three B and M's at Canada's Wonderland, Yukon Striker. So this is their um, the B and M dive coaster there that opened just in 2019, so like a year before the pandemic. And is the I didn't, was it the tallest at the time, or is it still the tallest? Something like that. I think it's tied with Val Raven is the tallest, but the drop is bigger because it goes into the tunnel. Got it. Yes, it shares its height record with Valraven, yeah. But it is slightly mm-hmm. longer. It's obviously like another sort of very giant on the scale of dive coasters. And I know that I think uh, a bunch of us have also been on a bunch of the dive coasters in the country. Uh, Nick, what were your thoughts sort of in general on Yukon Striker? I think overall it was the most surprising coaster for me. I, like, I was surprised by how much I liked it. You know, I, I like all the other B&M dive coasters. Like, there's not a bad one. They're all great rides. But I think for most coaster enthusiasts, if you say rank your, you know, top 10 coasters, I don't know if anyone has a dive coaster really in their top 10. They're usually yeah. going to be like the RMCs and the Hypers. I'd been on, uh, you know, Val Raven at Cedar Point was the most recent dive I'd been on, which again, like, it's a g- g- great ride. But if you're going to Cedar Point, that's probably like the fifth most <laughs> coaster you're looking forward to there's probably like four other coasters you grab yeah. are looking forward to more than Val raven so you know same here like i was looking forward to it because it was the the newest big coaster since i had last been there but yeah it was still like a dive coaster but yeah i was really surprised by, by how much i liked it i would even say that it's probably my favorite dive coaster overall the dr- first drop is huge i love how it goes through the vortex uh, track and the the underwater tunnel and then yeah. it goes up into that massive 183 foot tall inversion, third tallest inversion in the world, apparently. <laughs> yes, I remember you. You know what the other two are, right? Yeah, because I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steel Curtain's number one, and there's some wing coaster in China that's number two. Yeah. Uh, John, what were your thoughts on on Yukon Striker? I loved it. It was. I have a soft spot for dive coasters. Not sure why, uh, but they're they're fun. Yes, they don't do anything groundbreaking. They're not. I, I don't think there are many. Uh, they'll make many appearances in top ten lists, but I think this one I really I really like the inversions. I mean, the drop was amazing. I loved the drop through the the uh, water, um, but I really liked the Immelman, uh, the the mini Immelman. I just thought it was cute and adorable. The vertical loop, I think, is one of the first ones on a dive coaster, if not the first. So the, it's the only one, at least in North America, right? That's what I thought, yeah. and it's interesting because it, you know, with the trains as wide as they are, I just never thought we'd see a vertical loop on a on a dive coaster. So maybe that's why they went with the eight across trains instead of the ten seat ac- ten across. But um, I guess my one critique was, you know, the post mid-course break run kind of a little unnecessary i would say but uh a little mini drop and turn so not you know that it kind of loses its steam there but everything else is it was just a great ride and i think of course we have to talk about the loose article mini, uh, the ride for your loose articles i guess is the best way to everybody gets to ride yes which i think we we talked to move we probably tweeted a lot about it or wrote about it when it first opened in 2019, but yes, the like uh, dry cleaner esque conveyor belt system for bins that uh, you put your like bags and water bottles and stuff in like bin that's on this overhead conveyor belt and it goes over the track so that when you get off, it is timed perfectly to uh, the bin is there at the exit for you, which really speeds up the. Uh, <laughs> 
boarding and and exiting of the train. It's like I think they were running three trains the whole time, I think, and were getting through them very quickly. There was like not a lot of stacking on it. Um and it was also interesting that there's like four separate lines that feed into the station. There's like the fast lane line, single riders, a separate line for the first row, and then another yep. line for the last two rows. Yeah. And it moves fast. Because we were, I think we had all agreed we would ride the single, you know, we would wait in single riders to save time. And we never did just because it, you know, standard standby was was moving at a, at a pretty fast clip. Yeah. And I think we, rode, the second time we rode, we waited for the front row and it was not significantly longer than uh the other two rows even the way it split um i think i agree with you guys that was i would say without question the like first act of it i think was the best dive coaster (laughs) i've been on um i think that yeah that vertical loop on it was great and it's just like it's another one it felt like the like you mentioned nick the interactions with the tracks of vortex the aero suspended coaster and um going under the the tunnel and like the amount of time it spent like it worked with the terrain very well which is i think uncommon for a lot of dive coasters i want to say like val raven is kind of just on a open grassy plot right mm-hmm. um and so that's like i loved all of that it kept it speed up and then yeah like you said john sort of the main issue with it seems to be it's got this like mid-course break run that's actually like probably the last quarter course of the ride and then kind that's of like, one of the things that like makes it different than the other dive coasters because i think almost every other dive coaster you, you go down the big drop you do one inversion and then you immediately go up into the break run yep. where you have a second vertical drop that's a little bigger but in this case you go through all four inversions first before you hit that break run so that the dive off the break run is smaller it's and a, the ending's a, a little not yeah. as it's a very very short uh, <laughs> dive on the the second dive um and sort of like it doesn't really do much after that <laughs> if the break run had maybe been like one element earlier and they had fit one more element after the break run yeah maybe it would have made it like the perfect ride felt more balanced although that also could be part because it's like interacts with more stuff around it yeah maybe the, the final helix stations. is like right over the pathway which yeah. is cool when you're on the pathway looking up but doesn't do that much for the ride <laughs> yeah um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's, I think for me, I would say that it's like, uh, maybe like Griffin or something being slightly higher just because of the like overall experience and the way the the second half goes. But I think the, no question that like the, the beginning of Yukon Striker is, was the best. And I think actually I was a little surprised by that because I wrote Val Raven is one that like, even though it's bigger and taller than like Griffin and uh, Shikura, I sort of. I think it underwhelmed me a little bit the first time. And it's always I always expect it to be a little more exciting than it is, and I felt like Yukon Striker was as exciting as I hoped it would be. Yeah. Um, which is great. Plus, the conveyor system for the bags makes it that makes it the <laughs> best it cool. ride at the park. Um, as we, John, you mentioned, I think that Leviathan was your favorite of these three. Nick, are you in a similar? <laughs> put, put, put me on any one of them. Yeah. They're all great to me. It's it's yeah, it's it's hard to rank them uh above the other ones. Yeah. But. I think that's what I sort of said in our write up. I was like I think Behemoth I was surprised by how much I liked it the most. So that was what I, I think maybe put as number one on the on the blog post we wrote about it. Um but yeah, I think put me on any one of them. They were all great. That night ride on Leviathan maybe put it above the rest, but that isn't fair because yeah. it was a front row <laughs> last ride of the night. At, 10 p.m. or whatever i guess so other than these big three are there maybe starting with you john like were there any other coasters on the like 16 17 coasters were there any that uh stood out to you as surprises or that you didn't know about beforehand and like now it's one of your favorite coasters um i and honestly that's kind of where i struggled a little bit with ranking my top five because i think obviously the b&ms are the standouts there and then once you get beyond those I, I guess the standouts to me were Vortex, which I had no idea its layout was so close to the to the bat, if not, well, it was very, very close to the bat at Kings Island, which I love. Um, Wonder Mountain's Guardian was unique, not necessarily a, a you know, a, a incredible attraction itself, but the concept was uh, was interesting. 
Um, I love Backlot Stone Coaster, all the other two. So I was glad to finally ride the the uh, third one. And what else? Um, Thunder Run, the powered coaster that was that was fun as well, being kind of incorporated into the mountain. So I guess those were the standout ones. I mean, they it, it's such an interesting mix of rides. Um, I could go through most of them and kind of point out something, but it's hard to really rank the f- ones after the B&Ms because none of them really stood out to me as being just, I, I've got to go get back in line for this. Nick, do you agree with that? Or are there are ones that you did want to go back and get in line? <laughs> <laughs> there were a few kind of mid-tier average coasters that were, they were all right. But yeah, this is one of those parks that it's not, you know, a Dollywood or a Busch Gardens Williamsburg where you could argue that, you know, there's no bad coasters there. This is a park where like the best rides are really good but the worst rides are really bad. Uh, yeah, that's fair. We can we can talk about that yeah. in a minute, a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, like uh, John was saying, uh, I always thought that uh, the Bat at Kings Island and Vortex at Canada's Wonderland were the exact same layout, but they're actually slightly different. So that was uh, cool to find out. And you know, the, the length of the train is different. I just the the Vortex feels more like swingier. Like there's more side to side motion. Like especially when you hit the brake run at the end, it seems like there's less dampening. Like you're still swinging back and forth for longer than you are on the bat. Yeah, I think we so we had there was ERT for pass holders um, that morning. Vortex was the only coaster available in ERT. So Nick and I rode it twice in the morning. I feel like the second time I don't remember what row we were in, but I feel like when we got into the station, we were swung a full 90 degrees <laughs> yeah yeah i think um, we were we rode the second time in the front and yeah we were really swinging i think we sw- like had more swinging in the front seat than we did what the first time we rode which was in the very back seat yeah um and i think i agree with you on that i was like i know i guess i'm i know lots of people have fondness for the bat i haven't been to king's island in a long time like i remember liking it but don't remember like i think it was amazing whereas i think this like to me, I think Vortex was clearly the fourth best coaster at Canada's Wonderland. I was surprised, but I mean, I I ride Ninja at Six Flags Magic Mountain relatively often. Like I like all of these suspended coasters, but and there's just what four suspended coasters left in North America, something like that. Yeah, and I we was must surprised, protect like, them. This really stood out to me as being like I think the best, probably of the best one yeah. that I've been on. I was sort of I was very surprised by. It. I think it's also benefits. Um, like we said with Yukon Striker interacting with the Vortex track, the Vortex track uh, interacts with the Yukon Striker track a lot. Mm-hmm. It also goes up the back of um, so Canada's Wonderland mm-hmm. sort of main centerpiece. The equivalent of the Disneyland castle is this Wonder Mountain in the middle. Um, and Vortex, the lift hill goes up yep. the back of it and that sort of goes over the top. And- it goes underneath um, Wonder Mountain's Guardian. Yeah. So you're just swinging through all these coaster supports over the water. It's really cool. Yeah, it's got. So I think that is maybe part of it that's always, as we, as we know from any ride, like if you go past a lot of stuff, it always feels faster and uh, more more thrilling. So maybe it's that that makes it, maybe, maybe the stats are all the same. And it's actually just that that made it feel that way. But I think for me, that was the, the most surprising uh, and like, oh yeah, the, the cleaner fourth best coaster. As so John, you mentioned Thunder Run, and I think that was um, the the one that I was also like at the end of the night. That's what I or in the end of the day. That's like the one I wanted to go get a second ride on, which is this powered coaster. I think it's a, it's a Mac powered coaster from 1981. I think it's the only one of this kind in North America, um, and I assume the the only one of its kind that was ever in North America. Um, there's a bunch in Europe, but <laughs> not here. And that was the like. Yeah, it was just like it goes in out of the Wonder Mountain, which we learned from uh, Tyler Knapp of Wonderland Weekly on YouTube. You should go follow him. He met up with us and gave us tips and showed us around a little bit and was telling us that it used to be somewhere else in the park and then got relocated to be inside the mountain. Um, and it sort of goes in and out and has this double helix and takes two circuits. And it's just like one of those coast rides that is just like it's very fun. I couldn't tell you what any of the stats are it didn't seem like crazy fast or crazy certainly not tall it's a powered coaster but but it feels it feels faster than it actually is probably it's one of those rides like space mountain yeah exactly and it's like i could ride that over and over and have a blast on it 
it actually goes 40 miles an hour. So it's, I mean, it it's actually a, is fast. <laughs> it's a, yeah. It actually goes at a pretty good speed. And I, yeah, you're right. It, when you're inside mountain, it seems like it's going even faster and yeah. there's some effects inside. So I just know it was, I was shocked when I found out that it was once built outside and there's a picture you can see on RCDB that it's just, you know, outside chilling out in the open. And then they just on a dirt lot back in the, 80s. yeah. Yeah. So kudos to whoever thought to put, put it inside a mountain. Yeah. Uh, so that was, to me, that was the, like the, the fifth, like, Oh, this is clearly a special unique ride. And yeah, I could, I could keep riding it and have a blast on it all day. We want to touch on the, the, what I think we probably both agree are the worst rides or all agree are the worst rides at the park. The, I think that the two big wooden coasters are those, is there anything else that you guys would put down there well we didn't we didn't ride the boomerang or the slc so we should this is true all right so we can't we can't give those credit but let's let's talk about the two wooden coasters so wild beast and mighty canadian mindbuster both opened when the park did in 1981 nick what what were your thoughts on those two i thought of those two the wild beast was the worst of the two because there was a spot where you come down the first drop and some something about it just hurt my back so bad (laughs) <laughs> it was just like a loud like oh i'm glad i was able just to keep riding after that because it was not fun john did you uh went to, did you i mean i think I, you're saying that mighty canadian mind buster is not good though right john or nick was that was that <laughs> on mighty canadian mind buster yeah, did I mean, you uh it was i mean it wasn't as bad but it wasn't good either <laughs> yeah john do you feel similarly about both of those it, it, Honestly, as I was thinking back and writing and just trying to group my thoughts, and that's the thing with when you go to a park like this and there are 17 roller coasters and you're riding most of them, you know, they kind of run together a little bit. And that was especially the case for these two wooden coasters because I was thinking back and I was like, okay, I know one of them was near the water park and they were both very uncomfortable. And I honestly can't say which (laughs) of the two were less terrible. Yeah, it was really, unf- I, I hate, I, you know, the best coaster at the park, I think, is by by far is the little ghoster coaster uh, yes, over there. Their, their wooden family coaster. Yes, yes, that that was definitely my favorite. The other two, it it's truly hard for me to pick which one I would rather be stuck on. <laughs> yeah, I think the, I think I actually thought Wild Beast was worse. Yeah. Did I? No, I thought Mighty Canadian <laughs> Mindbuster was worse because I thought Wild Beast at least had like a couple things that I was like, oh, they, they, I got like a pop of air time. That was kind of fun. I feel like Mighty Canadian Mindbuster, I was just in pain the whole time with no other aspect to it. But I would rate both of those as you don't, it's not worth the credit to ride them, My would be my opinion. It's always worth the credit. Hmm. <laughs> you didn't ride the slc john we know it's not true <laughs> I, I that's true that's true <laughs> the boomerang was shut down so we could, that wasn't even an option yes. to try to ride Had it, an but, excuse not to ride yeah. <laughs> not to ride it uh, but, I, but i think we all agreed that that's one thing that the park could use is a mystic timber style gci actual yep. good wood coaster absolutely yeah yep. i think as people who all have home parks that have a gci built in the last 10 ish years 10 to 15 years that's like oh how do they not have a wooden coaster that is more recent than 1981 <laughs> that's like well clearly this is what this park needs well eric i know we talked throughout the day as we we rode these we were kind of debating which one would be more suited to have the rocky mountain construction rmc hybrid treatment so what do you guys think do you think do you have a preference of one over the other if you can only pick one to um, get that treatment. I think for me, without like looking back at what the layouts actually are, so Mighty Canadian Mindbuster is very much just a like straight out and back. It takes yep. up a very narrow, like very narrow stretch of land. Uh, I think next to like Backlock Sun Coaster and Yukon Striker or something like that. Um, it's hard to see like how much interesting twisting and stuff you could do with it. Whereas I feel like Wild Beast was more on like had a layout that maybe like, oh, RMC could take this plot of land and like do stuff with it to maybe make it more interesting. That would be my yeah. first. Yeah. My first first maybe thought. more similar to like the um, Twisted uh, Cyclone at Six Flags Over Georgia, that transformation. Like, I love that ride. So yeah, sign me up for that one. Yeah, same. Yeah. 
and then we can i don't know what to do i don't know what to do with the <laughs> with my canadian mind buster <laughs> i mean i'm never an advocate for tearing a coaster down but it kind of splits the water park in half so you know from a just infrastructure standpoint it might <laughs> Addition by subtraction. <laughs> right, bridge the gap. And I'm also not a water park person, but... Uh... So, if you, I think we would all say that the coasters at Canada's Wonderland are worth making a trip for, but maybe skip the wooden coasters, at least for now. Are there other things other things about the park that you really liked to add to you or surprised you? John, I know, so it was your first time ever there, John. Was there something that just more generally about the park that surprised you? It was very well kept. I mean, I think that was something that I just, when, you know, when I was telling people when we got back about the park, it was huge. It was much larger than I was expecting. And I, maybe that's just the way that the park is laid out. But I felt like we just kept going and, and exploring and, and seeing parts of the park we hadn't seen before. And, you know, some parks you, you make a loop and you feel like you've seen it. But this is it's such a sprawling layout. Um, so I think that just its sheer size and it was just a, it was a really well-kept park. I, uh, the mountain it, is beautiful. I mean, that the fountain it's at the, at the front of the park. I mean, it's just a really gorgeous park. So I think it's, it's size and, um, the, just the aesthetics of it. Um, I think those were the two things that, that I liked most. Nick, and this, I know you'd been there a couple times briefly, but was there anything you sort of discovered this time that you hadn't gotten a chance to see on your previous trips uh like john was saying just how scenic the park is so, like there's lots of little like creeks and things kind of meandering through the park and just how massive it is like we kept discovering new areas but also you know the operations being so good i would say they are you know on yeah. par with king's island as being some of the best operations of any regional park they were running three trains very efficiently on every coaster so that was really nice to see yeah i think i would certainly second that i don't know it's because they're like canadian or because they're next to a big city or something but like was very impressed that even on a what seemed like it should have been a crowded uh sunday in early august like feels like it should have been packed and like was certainly not empty but leviathan like we said had sort of a 45 minute to an hour wait and that was by far the longest all day i think i don't think we waited more than maybe 20 minutes for anything else there were a couple walk-ons i think we did like 23 something rides throughout the day and that's without getting fast lanes so we had debated like the night before should we buy fast lanes or not and i i'm glad we didn't because those are very uh, expensive but we definitely did not need them yeah, yeah we, we did 20 something rides with without fast lane and that's also with taking you know two meal breaks and another snack break and, and- stopping to take lots of pictures and things like that and lots of long walks as we said big part yeah. especially we going back to the kitty area of the park it's like uh it's very far set back from yeah. uh the front of the park i think also seconding what you said john to me it was like oh the i, I don't know if it, maybe i just like had never looked at pictures of candace wonderland from the front but like the way the mountain in the middle works like i think maybe outside of a Disneyland castle like is maybe one of the best sort of centerpieces. Certainly I think of other um, like regional or Cedar fair parks. And I think the amount that the park like uses the mountain was very impressive to me. Like the front has this big waterfall that they do like this diving show off of and have like divers jump off the top into the pool at the bottom and then have in three different roller coasters that all are either inside or (laughs) interact with the mountain Uh, thunder run being on one half and wonder mountain guardian kind of on the other side and then the vortex on the back going up and over to the top um and sort of i think there's still other space in the mountain (laughs) that like maybe they'll do something with someday it's just like i can't think of a centerpiece that a park like actually incorporates into its attractions as much as as what Canada's Wonderland has done with Wonder Mountain. Um, I think to me that was the the biggest surprise of like, oh, we kept going back to that centerpiece and like mm-hmm. not just walking past it, but like doing something there. Uh any any other final thoughts on Canada's Wonderland? Would you recommend it to any of our American listeners to like renew their passports and well, first what there? did you guys what did you guys think about the food? Oh yeah, it's always my second favorite ride at the park. Uh, Nick, any food thoughts? 
I forget what I had, but I know it was, remember it was very good. <laughs> uh, yes, I think I remember appreciating a few that like there was some diversity in options. Uh, I think we. Uh, I'm now forgetting the name of the Oswell Hall. I think is the one that we. Yeah, that was had the first one we ate lunch at. Lunch at, and that was um, uh, Grace Peacock, the uh, PR director, I think for Canada's Wonderland, had recommended that to us. I think it had just recently reopened, um, and that was very solid. Uh, and I know we yeah. we got some beaver tails as required. If you're at Canada's Winterland, John, what were your, what were your beaver tail thoughts? It was it was pretty light. It was a lot lighter and kind of <laughs> more airy. And piece I was of expecting. fried dough that John thought was nice and light. <laughs> yeah, I know. I felt you I was can like, tell oh, John's oh, from wow. the south. Yeah, right. I, well, hey, listen, I'm used to if I'm getting something, it's cinnamon bread. So, um, but it was good. And I got the I, I have a thing when I try new food, I try to get like the base just the kind of no frills version and go from there. So I got the, just the standard, you know, sugar on top. And um, I think everybody else got the more gourmet varieties, which looked really good. And I definitely regretted not getting those, but it was good. I mean, yeah, it's fried dough. Like, come on now. I think there was a, I know that they are, there's some new restaurants. that are still under construction that I think have been a little delayed. Um, So I would be curious as well. I think like, it seems like the Cedar Fair parks across the board kind of as they've been building new restaurants in the last few years, like the new places are where they tend to get a little more adventurous, I guess, with like the food options and stuff. But it was certainly all solid. And I think falls in line with what other Cedar Fair parks have been doing recently in terms of upping the quality of food. I will also give credit to um, there's a, very large selection of park specific beers and ciders i think two or three ciders and then like four uh beers brewed specifically for the park Um, i tried a couple of them which i now forget which ones i tried um but they were all made by local toronto area breweries and cideries and all the ones i tried were delicious um and i think this is of parks i've been to this is the widest selection of theme park specialty beer that i have seen and if we i probably should have had more we were there for like 12 hours i could have had more um but like always always nice to see more of those and i wonder is that another canadian thing that they have like six seven different specialty brews instead of like the two or three that other parks seem to have i think they did a good job of i think for a a regional park they did probably one of the best jobs of incorporating a lot of different cuisines. So where we went for dinner, Backlot Cafe, they had, it was kind of like a, uh, a food court with different stations. They had Canadian, Middle Eastern, Indian, Italian, Mexican. So I liked that even though um, as an indecisive person, things like that, having that many options stressed me out. <laughs> it was still really cool to see all the different uh, types of food being cooked and I went with the lasagna which was amazing so it was just it was a really diverse uh, menu really a- across the park any other any other thoughts Nick anything else about the park you want to touch on yeah I think there's there's two more things we should t- touch on uh, one is Wonder Mountains Guardians so that's one that I had been on before when I visited the park but it was new for uh, you and John so what were your guys' thoughts uh, on that dark ride coaster combo so i was on the bad side of the car where you get the <laughs> non-continuous screen and there are some brakes i also had been um because uh, a company that did wonder mountain guardian also did voyage to the iron reef at knott's berry farm which recently was replaced by knott's berry tail um and one of my issues with voyage to the iron reef was, was not coaster like but had very similar screens it was just like the quality of the animation felt very dated, like immediately. <laughs> um, so I think that was like my only issue with Wonder Mountain Guardian is that like screens were like the animation feels like it could use an upgrade. Um, but I appreciate that it felt more roller coaster like, and especially like uh-huh. the beginning of it, it's like a roller coaster. Um, there's four seats and then you sit back to back. So there's two people facing forward, two people facing backwards. You go up the hill, go down the drop. And you go inside the mountain, that's where the cars rotate to face either side, where then you're facing screens. But one side is better than the other because one is a continuous video screen, even around the turns where the other side is, the screen is broken up, like, and just yeah. flat the, pieces. The corners are just sort yeah. of, like, blank, which I think we talked about, like, oh, they 
could put some like physical props in those corners and it would make it feel much better. Yeah. I think it could use it could use some like a little bit of like Plussy. practical <laughs> stuff on the inside would also make it like, oh, okay, it's not just like a wall of screens. There's like even if it's just like a statue or something would work. Disco but Yeti. face face forward is the yeah. is the the lesson. Uh, John, what'd you, what'd you think of it? I liked it. It's weird. It's like one of the things where if you put it all together, it it wasn't necessarily, it was one of those things that, you know, I don't know if we ever went back to it later in the day to see what the line was like, but as a whole, it wasn't necessarily that astounding, but I did love that it was built into the mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, I did love the first kind of coaster section. I did love the surprise at the end, which I will not spoil, but I, had really not, I don't know, there was just nothing when it opened uh, or I was distracted. Maybe there were cooler things opening that year, but I didn't really give it that much attention. So I hadn't done that much research on it. So it was, I, I guess, because I really had no expectations, I enjoyed it. But it's not something I would get back in line for. Yeah, I think it was one of those. I think maybe my expectations were too high because like, I liked the idea of the hybrid dark ride roller coaster and uh had been very excited to try it and like it was fun i would happily ride it every time i'm at the park uh but yeah i'm not sure i wouldn't like i wouldn't wait in a super long line for it but it was like i'm glad that it exists just as like parks doing it's another ride that's like unique to canada's wonderland which is i think what i appreciate especially if i'm traveling to visit a new park Uh, speaking of unique rides um even though we're not really flat ride or spinny ride people I think it's safe to say that Canada's Wonderland is the flat ride capital of at least North America. So they yes. have some some crazy ones and some unique ones. Uh, we only rode one of them, but I think we picked the best one of them to ride. At yes. least Eric and I did. <laughs> yeah, John, John watched us. Uh, uh, yes, it, there, it was as fun to watch as it was to ride, yeah, I think. So or it had, you know. Sledgehammer. Nick, do you want to try and describe, describe it's Sledgehammer? It's hammer time! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, that was actually one of the best parts of the ride are the uh, the operators for that one they really get into it and it's a good time and even if you're not riding just walking by on the midway of that ride just adds like so much life to the midway yeah it's basically like a giant hydraulic with spinning sort of cars on the end of arms that yeah there's like launch pairs up of and seats, down. like four pairs of seats on an arm and then that, there's like six or eight arms and yeah, they and then the whole thing spins around, and then the whole thing, yeah, every so often like lifts way up into the air, and they hold you up in the air, and then they bring you back down, and they lift yeah. you back up. Look up, look up a video of Sledgehammer yeah. at we'll, Canada's Wonderland. We'll make a video we, uh, in the, <laughs> yeah. uh, the show notes. Um, and we, it is, it was sort of. I think, I mean, Nick, I, I think we had similar experiences writing it that like not actually that bad spinning we're pretty sure even if you don't like spinning, nick and i don't yeah, love yeah. spinning rides but are tolerant of them but it was like relatively gentle but then when the arms dropped was like a, a big thrill a yeah. fantastic <laughs> feeling <laughs> like uh excellent driving you know, they're not dropping a yeah. huge distance and they're like not it's not like going doing anything crazy but it was just like oh this is so exciting each time it does this. yeah yeah well, I mean, we kind of waited towards the end of the day to ride it because i was i was nervous about doing it like oh is this gonna make me sick or something yeah. but it was actually fine and then like i'm I, i'm really glad we we did it because i loved it yes um and yeah i think in general the like there's a huge selection of flat rides at the park yeah. which so like if you're into flat rides as far as I could tell, they had almost every yeah. <laughs> their flat kind. ride capacity is crazy. Yeah, and both like recent modern ones as well as like more older classic ones. So, uh, which probably also helps keep the coaster lines shorter to have that many uh, different flats taking up people. Yeah, I'm, I, like I can't even think of another park that has like half as many flats as they do. Yeah, especially not operating. It seemed like I mean. <laughs> Just about everything was. I can't think of any besides uh, the boomerang. The boomerang that was the only one that was closed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think maybe one that a rapids ride was maybe closed, but we also never, never really, found really the saw it. To the rapids <laughs> ride. So I think it's like way back behind the water park or something. <laughs> Anything else that you want to touch on, John? Overall, just a really fun park. I think uh, definitely uh, make the trip out there. Um, I, th- I think it's. I think it's safe to say it's a full day park. Um, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Really enjoyed it. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the next, or the, I guess, that, what do you guys think? I know 
Eric, you mentioned the need for a, a wooden coaster. Um, Nick, what do you think? I mean, what what is this park missing? Like we touched on, yeah, they could definitely use the, uh, the actual good wooden coaster. I mean, even addition by subtraction is getting rid of some of their lower capacity, you know, worse experience coasters and replacing them with modern <laughs> coasters like they've been doing is a step in the right direction. Uh, they don't, well, what about launch coasters? I think Backlot's the only launch yep. coaster, so they could use definitely a, a modern uh, launch coaster, which I guess they're getting another launch coaster next year for the and the family coaster, but maybe even a, a, a higher tier launch coaster after yep. that. Yeah, I feel like a uh, launch coaster and wooden coaster are a good new wooden coaster are kind of the only things. I mean, it's got they've got obviously a large coaster selection. Um, you know, if you want to get a flying coaster that wasn't the uh, San Perla Ferrari, which, I, as I said in our post about it, I thought was not as bad as I would be led to believe it was. But like, I don't think yeah, that's yeah. drawing big crowds anymore. <laughs> If if you're looking for space inside the park, if you took out Flight Deck, the SLC, and Time Warp, the, the flying coaster, that's a pretty sizable plot of land right there. Because the the queue space for Flight Deck is like the same size as Time Warp, <laughs> so that would be a, a nice plot of land you could open up right there. Put it, yeah. you know, a, a modern flying coaster or a wing coaster right there at the front of the park. I think Tyler was saying the uh, parks. Very large, underutilized amphitheater was another spot that could clear up. And that would, I mean, you could clean out flight deck, time warp, the theater, the amphitheater, music theater, uh, Kingswood, and you would have a huge plot of land. I mean, you could build an entire new land. Like themed area there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I think so. I think we can all agree that Americans who are scared to cross the border should... uh, (laughs) dive into it and go to the second largest, third largest Cedar Fair Park. If you've got a Platinum Pass, very much worth uh, getting up to Canada's Wonderland and riding all of these things and taking it in. Uh, so thank you all for listening. As always, you should uh, subscribe, give us a review, leave some comments about Andrew uh, if you want to. Um Follow us on Twitter at, at Coaster101, Instagram at Coaster101, everywhere else. Go to Coaster101.com. We wrote up a blog post rating every ride at the park. So I was giving some rankings. I think we'll have some other posts in, over the next few weeks about Canada's Wonderland. Um, thank you to Jam Music Design for our music, as always. You should also uh, go follow Wonderland Weekly on YouTube, uh, Tyler Knapp does a great job with it uh and he was very helpful to us so we greatly appreciate uh yep. him giving us tips and showing us around canada's wonderland a little bit and with that we will say goodbye thanks nick thanks john okay.